So hi, my name is Kaushik. Thanks for having me here. I'm the co-founder of a startup named Ethereal Machines. We aren't your conventional kind of startups whose app you can download on your phone and your life will be easier, no. Instead, what we do is we manufacture something called a CNC routers. So what do CNC routers do? Right, so this is some of the sample work. So you provide in a design, you feed in a design to my machine and you provide it any material, wood, marble, granite, aluminum, plastic, and my machine will implement that design out on that particular material for you. So my clients buy these machines of us and they set up their own businesses. My clients have their own businesses in the field of wooden industry, metal precision industry, uh, aluminum industry, the plastic industry. So these guys buy the machines and then they use it. Like look at this, right? Like we have a Batman, a Transformers, a Batman. Isn't that amazing? I can keep working and playing with my machine all my life, but unfortunately that will not fill my stomach. So we have to go about selling these machines. How did we come up with this, right? So back in college, Naveen and I used to build robots, hovercrafts. And then we realized that to make better hovercrafts, better robots, we need more precisely cut out parts. And for that, we needed CNC routers. So Naveen and I thought, okay, let's go buy one CNC router. What's the big deal? Then we realized that the routers which are available in the market, the smallest was a four feet by eight feet machine, costed around seven to eight lakh rupees. Now Naveen and I don't have, we weren't born with silver spoons in our mouth, no. We were born with golden spoons in our mouth to be frank. But Naveen and I had a principle that we will not use money from our family to start up something. And for an engineering student at that point in time to accumulate that much amount of money is equivalent to, you know, wanting to marry Angelina Jolie. It doesn't work like that. So <laughs> instead what we did was we thought, okay, let's make a smaller machine and we'll use it for ourselves. So what did we do? We built a machine, we built a prototype, we tested it, turned out perfectly fine. We thought, okay, let's sell these machines. So our first office, right? Like, look at that. That's how our garage was handed over to us by our landlord. And that's what Naveen and I turned it into in overnight. We painted it, we cleaned it. You know, they say, right, entrepreneurs should be ready for all kinds of work. That's when we first realized that we have to really be ready for all kinds of work. And we enjoyed it. We didn't complain even a single bit about it. So we had a machine, we had a place, now we had to decide a name. A lot of you are youngsters, a lot of you people will come up with ventures tomorrow. I want you guys to keep this in mind. What do you do when you don't know about something? You Google it, right? Let's look at it from the perspective from the language English. Google has now become a verb. You Google things, I Google things. I came across the word ethereal. Ethereal is an adjective, it means, it means heavenly, celestial. I told Naveen, Let's transform this adjective into a noun. Today when my friends meet me and they ask me, how is Ethereal doing? They're using it as a noun and I know I've made some progress in that direction. So that's how we zeroed in on our name. Figuring out what to do, figuring out how to do, isn't that important. Figuring out why you want to do it is the most important thing. There's a famous quote by Martin Luther King which says, life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others? Four years of engineering, what was my schedule like? Go to college, write exams, gym, sleep. Go to college, write exams, gym, sleep. I was not doing anything for others. I was going to college for myself. The degree was for myself. Gymming was for myself. Sleeping, obviously, right? Who doesn't love it? All for myself. I was never doing anything for others. And that used to, and I used to feel very bad about it. And I thought that, okay, we need to do something for others. I went around uh, proposing my machine to different clients, telling them what they can do with it, how it will help them in their business. I faced 63 rejections. But I still kept going. This is the cover of my book. If you see, my mind and body had given up, but my soul still wanted to go because I figured out why to do it. Why did I want to do it? Let's go back to the problem I faced, right? I couldn't buy a cheaper machine. I couldn't buy a smaller machine. Imagine the number of other people who will be facing the same kind of problems. A person who wants to be an entrepreneur in an entire three city does not have money to buy a four feet by eight feet machine, does not have money to, you know, uh, purchase a seven to eight lakh rupee machine. Not just that, right? Like banks don't approve loans easily for these clients. You cannot rent out a huge space to fit in a four feet by eight feet machine. Commercial land rates are very high. So we realized, and I knew 
that my machine can be a solution for all of them. And not just these entrepreneurs, right, who want to set up businesses with my machine. Even people like Naveen and I who wanted to build better robots and better toys, even it will be of a huge help to them if I can sell this machine at a lesser rate and I can make and sell smaller machines. Let's go to why I failed and let's look at why I failed 63 times and let's look at the other reasons as to why usually entrepreneurs fail, right? You have didn't get funding, went bankrupt, you have improper team, you have lack of technology support, you have lack of knowledge about the field. Didn't get funding was not an issue for us. Naveen, uh, the client would pay us the money for the machine, we would set it up and we would give it back to him. We didn't need funding. Improper team, ha. Naveen and I think we can take on the entire world together, just the two of us, we don't want anyone else. L lack of technology support, not an issue, right? Because I have a working model. I was showing demonstrations to different clients who came down to our garage. Lack of knowledge about the field, not an issue again, because we knew what are the kind of clients we had to approach, what are the kind of applications our machines can be used for. We knew all about it. The two other reasons, couldn't compete with market leaders, didn't attract customers. The reason lays somewhere in between these two. These headings are obviously very uh, wide, but there are a lot of nuances under it. And Naveen and I just couldn't figure out what's the exact reason behind this. For around 30 to 40 rejections after that, Naveen and I sat down one night, and uh, we used to laugh about it, oh, we got rejected again, right? And then we thought, we don't know what the reason is. And we used to recite the famous dialogue from the movie Taken. We don't know who you are, but we will find you and we will kill you, right? <laughs> We always used to laugh about it. So if you look at it, right, for three months, I was shunted out of 60 offices, 63 offices. So that's every three days I had two rejections. I was shown the door every three days from two new offices. Let's talk about how I cracked my first order. And this is where the theme of this particular TED event comes into place. What's the theme of this event, right? Social norms give us an easy way of doing what is right. I have always been told, I was a bullied kid in school, when my teachers and my classmates used to ask me, what do you want to do? I used to say, I want to become a businessman. And they'd say, your voice is so meek, what will you become a businessman? I said, where's the relation? They said, you have to collect money from clients. No one will give you money with that kind of a voice. No one will listen to you. And, and that's what all the society and also used to tell me, right? That you have to be very cutthroat when it comes to collecting payments. You have to be very cutthroat in terms of payment deliveries. When your machine is going out of your factory or out of your setup, you collect 100% money and only then let your machine go. Because who knows, right? Once they start using the machine, they might not end up paying you. And I used to follow this norm because I, had, I was fed with this all throughout of 20, 22 years of my life. And that was the only thing which used to play in my head. And then one day, I realized that the problem, the reason why we kept failing was this. There was a huge trust deficit between clients and us. I was expecting clients to give me a few lakhs of rupees for their machines, for somebody who's not even sold a machine out in the market. And at the same time, I expected 100% payment delivery even before the machine reached their place. That would never work, right? I realized this trust deficit is what was causing the problem. And then I decided to let go of that one particular norm I had always been told of. I told my clients, you are trusting me, I'm an amateur. The same time, I will trust you with the payment terms. And I will, so my first client, Mr. Uh, Satinder Singh from Ludhiana, Punjab, he gave us 50% advance money and the next 50% he gave over the next four months. The idea behind this was simple, right? I told him why I wanted to do this. I told him, I want my machine to be the breadwinner for your family. I want your family to set up a venture with my machine and I want you guys to sustain your entire family with the revenue my machine will generate for you. And I have faith in my machine that you can generate that much money and you can pay me in installments. Boom, I had that order. His grandfather was a marble sculptor. He used to chisel out with his hands. He wanted to continue his grandfather's tradition, but he did not know how to chisel. So he uses our machine to create different products in marble and on granite. Within four months, I had my entire payment back and no issue at all after that because he's just put in such a good word about us out in the market. Not just that. 
three months ago, he called me up and he said, we've bought a Toyota Innova and our family has bought a car after a span of 15 years. All this was possible only because we let go of that one particular idea and a one particular norm that we have to be strict about money terms. My next client, right, uh, Mr. Damodar Naidu, he's based out of Bangalore. If you look at the picture to the right, you will see that a panel is missing at this end. The reason the panel is missing here is because my engineers, when, he went, when they went to his place, they could not fix the panel. The wall on this side was obstructing them from bending and fixing the screws. That's how small his place was. He couldn't afford to rent out a bigger place. He couldn't afford to buy a four feet by eight feet machine. So he bought a four feet by four feet machine. Not just that, right? Observe something else in the picture. He's performed a puja for the machine. When do we worship something? When we know that this particular product is going to create an impact in your life. You know this is going to be of so much importance for you that you worship it and you treat it with respect. I, f I was very happy when I saw this picture. He sent it to me. I wasn't there at the venue when he was doing a puja and he sent it to me saying, sir, thanks a lot for your support and uh, I hope to make a lot of money from this. Our next client, right? And this is when life comes full circle. This is a machine at an incubator, a startup incubator in Bangalore called IKP Labs. At IKP Labs, aspiring entrepreneurs can rent out a space and they can build their own products. Today, my machine at IKP is being used by a startup, a drone startup, to cut out precision parts for their drones and for their hovercrafts. Not just that, it's also being used for medical equipment prototyping. These, this is a direction in which we never work towards, even though we created the router, we created this product because of that particular problem we had. We couldn't make better drones or better hovercrafts because we didn't have this machine. But the solution is present today, even though I didn't work towards selling a machine for that purpose, all because of that one particular idea. Something I want you guys to look closely at. If you come to my house, you will not see a framed picture on the wall of me standing in my convocation robes, in the black robe with a hat, with my father standing to my right in a suit, with my mother standing to my left in a beautiful sari. No, nor will you see me smiling in that kind of a picture. I in fact went late for my graduation, they didn't even give me my degree. They gave me a blank folder and said take a photo and go home. <laughs> That's what happened. But look at this picture. I am standing amidst dirt and dust and rubble in our 280 square feet office. We used to literally jump, stand on this machine, go to the other side and then exit the office. There was no space for us to walk around, enter and exit this place. But look at the smile on my face. It's only because I know that this machine is going to change the life of one of my clients and it's going to create a huge impact in his life and he's going to set up a venture with it. When you guys are setting up ventures tomorrow, when you guys meet entrepreneurs tomorrow, don't ask them if they got funding. Don't ask them if they have a fancy office. Don't ask them how many employees do you have. Don't ask them what your profit margins are. Don't ask them what your revenue is. Ask them why they're doing it. Ask them what is the impact that your product is going to create. Ask them what is the kind of change they aspire to uh, cause in the society with what they, what, what they are creating. The ball is in your court. You need, to be, you need to take a decision whether you want to be cutthroat or not. Thank you.